I'm Abby West. I'm a product manager here at Looker. I'm a, a stage pacer, so you're going to have to just accommodate that. Uh, and I'm here to talk about smart caching for fresher, faster data. It works. OK. Um, the first thing that's important, and if I'm too loud, sound guys, I'm a shouter. So also, you might have to turn me down. I heard that I was hurting people's ears in the other presentation. Anyway, um, we're going to start by talking about what Looker's cache is uh, and what it's used for. So when you run a query in Looker, whether that's from a scheduled report, whether that's from the Explore page, a dashboard, the API, anywhere, uh, the results of that query go into Looker's cache. And when that same query is run again, so long as the cache is still valid, you'll be served those cached results uh, instead of Looker going back to your database and pulling uh, the results of that query again. So um, that's a really nice feature that both lowers the load on your database and it makes results come back to your users faster provided uh, that query has been run before. And Looker's always had what I consider basic caching. I have to say I had some really fun like basic things that I was going like, to put on the slide to make it funny, but um, I wasn't sure if they were going to land, so now I just told you about them so you can imagine how funny they were. <laughs> okay, so Looker's default cache is one hour. If you've been a Looker customer for a very long time, uh, our cache time by default used to be five minutes. It's now one hour by default. Um, and we've always had this uh, parameter persist for that would allow you to set your own arbitrary cache length if you wanted it to be longer or shorter than that default of one hour. Um, and what happens when the cache expires is that we get rid of all of those result sets that we've cached, uh, saved for you. And uh, we, that's called invalidating the cache or busting the cache. There's lots of terms for it. Um, and that means when you run that same query you've already run once before again, you're going back to the database, you're getting fresh data. So um, again, like just make the basic joke in your head for me. Um, I consider that, that initial caching to be basic for a reason, which is, Sometimes that cache length that you set in Looker was too short. That means uh, you went back to your database to get fresh data, but your database actually didn't have any more data in it, right? So uh, you could have just used the cache results and you would have gotten the same answers that you got before. So that's putting unnecessary strain on your database. The other side of that is if it is too long, if your cache setting is too long, you will query that same query, you'll set that same SQL back, you'll get stale results, because actually there was fresh data in your database, but you're hitting the cache instead of going back to the database and getting that fresh information. Luckily, uh, we have smart caching now. So smart caching is basically tying your cache in Looker to the ETL jobs that you're running for your database. So you can basically tell Looker, and can we just like appreciate my graphic here. Um, OK, so you're taking your data from all these different data sources, and you, you're running these ETL jobs to get it into your database. Um, and now Looker's able to actually know when that happens. So based on the data that you're bringing in, we can actually refresh your cache. We can invalidate that cache and let you get at that fresh data, but only when it's actually there. So who's it for? Should have made this one come in later. Anyway, it's for everybody. Um, we anticipate that almost everybody has some use for data groups and for smart caching. Um, there are a couple exceptions. If you have databases that stream uh, or update in near real time, or you're using Looker in some particular operational use cases. I was actually talking to somebody yesterday who works for a media property, and she was saying they stream data like as soon as they put a story on their front page. Is she even in here? It could be cool. Uh, anyway, um, she, as soon as they put a story on the front page, they're actually streaming uh, the number of people who are clicking on that and seeing it. So in that kind of case, you wouldn't want to, you, you don't really need to set up data groups to control when that gets updated because you're just passing data all the time. You want to just set, I guess you could actually set a max cache age of a very small amount. Anyway, you just don't necessarily need it if you have an operational use case. Uh, but the, even in cases, I'll just go back to this, even in cases where you do have an operational use case or you are looking at some real-time data, there are probably also analytical use cases within your company where you could take advantage of this. So almost every customer we expect to be able to use this. How does it actually work? And this is where I might have to get corrected by my engineers here. Um, the first thing you're going to do is define your data groups. So this is done at the model level. I've set up uh, two data groups here, and you can set up as many data groups as you want. You'll probably want to set up as many data groups as you have different ETL processes. You might be bringing in data at a different cadence for different parts of your business. So you'll want to set up different data groups for each of those ETLs. So what I've set up here um, is one for my web event ETL. 
that's, that's set up with a SQL trigger value. That's one of the properties on this data group that has, uh, I'm just looking for a new event to occur in my uh, ETL jobs table. So that's telling me that an ETL job has completed. Um, I should have put a different example for my second data group. You can do any SQL trigger value. So you can look at like an orders table and just check to see if you have another order in it as an indication that your ETL has transpired. You don't have to go to those ETL jobs tables. It's just one of the ways you can set it up. But anyway, it's getting a trigger. Uh, it's setting a SQL trigger value that will let me know if uh, an event has transpired and that's going to trigger my data group. The second one is my order data ETL. I have that looking at my order data ETL jobs table. So again, that's looking at a different place to get its indication that the data group should be triggered. And I added another parameter on there called max cache age. Max cache age is optional. Technically, SQL trigger value is optional. You could use either of these to trigger your database. But what max cache age does, um, it does two things. It operates basically like a persist for. Um, it basically says, after 36 hours, that's as old as this cache can ever be. Bust my cache if I get to 36 hours. So it's very similar to persist for um, of, of that time period. And the reason that we introduced this is um, to kind of create a secondary fail state. So on my first data group, my web event ETL, my failure state is to uh, hit the cache, meaning if for some reason my ETL job goes, but my ETL job table doesn't get updated, you're just going to keep hitting uh, the looker cache because there's no indication we should bust the cache. When I have that max cache age, it's kind of the opposite failure state. It's saying, I always, at a certain point, I'm going to want fresh data. So if for some reason my job didn't get triggered, uh, I want you to just blow away my cache after 36 hours. I'm sure there's fresh data in there, or we'll at least go back to the database and find out. Does that make sense? I guess questions at the end, sorry. I have to keep going. OK, then the next thing you're going to do is associate data groups with models and explore. So in this first step here, all we did was name the data groups. We haven't used them in any way. Um, we'll know if they get hit, but it won't do anything um, until we associate those data groups with models and explorers. So the parameter we use for this is persist with. Um, persist with can be set at the model level, and then it'll be inherited by everything within that model. So you can just set it once if you want everything in the model to persist with the same data group. But you can also override that data group at the explore level. Um, so you can see I have here at the example model level, I'm persisting with my order data ETL. And I, for redundancy's sake, wrote that also on my orders explore. But my events explore is persisting with my web event ETL, right? So that's persisting with different data. It's not going to refresh when the order data comes through. It's going to refresh. It's going to wait for the event data. Or more likely, it's going to come earlier uh, with my event data. The next thing you can do is associate data groups with PDTs. So instead of a SQL trigger value, we're replacing that with, yeah, a data group trigger. So before you would have used a SQL trigger value, now you're just using a data group trigger. So you'll put a data group name there and say, refresh this drive table, this persisted drive table, when, I, uh, when my data group is triggered. So when my event, or when my ETL happens, my, in this case, my web event ETL, when that happens, start building a new PDT. And we're going to hold on to the old PDT for you until this new one is done building. So you'll always have a PDT to query. But as soon as this new PDT is finished building, we'll just get rid of the old one and replace it with this one. Um, you can check on the status of your PDTs in your PDT panel. And there's now a new uh, component there that will tell you that it is in a triggered state, which will mean it's starting to build a new one, but it's still holding on to the old one while, you're, while uh, it's waiting for that to finish. So you can see some of that in the admin panel if you want to. The next thing you can do is associate data groups with content. Uh, and the place you do that is in the scheduler modal. So um, really impossible to see on these slides unless you're uh, lucky enough to be sitting right in front of them. But there's now a trigger option. Uh, all existing schedules will automatically default to being set on a trigger of schedule, because that's what we used to have. Uh, but if you want them to be associated with a data group instead, you can switch the trigger to be a data group. And then you can select the data group that you want to be that trigger. And what that does, there's really two, I think, core use cases for that. Say you just you have a report. Right now, you have it scheduled daily. But sometimes it sends. Uh, at 6 AM, but your ETL hasn't finished, so actually it sent the same data that you got yesterday. Instead of setting that to be daily, you can set it to be uh, triggered by the data group, and it won't run until the new data is there. That way, you're guaranteeing that the, the report you're sending out actually has fresh data in it. The other use case is uh, 
a way to, and I'm, you guys have to like swear to use this responsibly. The other thing you can do with this is use this to uh, pre-warm your cache to a certain extent. Um, so if you have core dashboards that you know everybody looks at in your business and you want those to be, um, you basically only if ever want those to be cached, you really don't want anyone to have that first load experience while you go back to the database, um, you can set these to be scheduled. They'll trigger as soon as your data group is triggered. They'll refresh. You can have them sent to somebody if they actually need to receive it or uh, we're going to be building like a schedule to cache option right now. Some people just schedule to a dummy account or to themselves or whatever it is. Um, That'll schedule the, all the queries will be run and put in the cache, so the first person who comes to that piece of content will actually get the um, cache data. No one will have to get that first load experience. The reason I say be responsible with this um, is if you go and set every single piece of content on your instance to be triggered by a data, by a data group, as soon as the data group goes, you're gonna like your database is gonna be totally overwhelmed and you're gonna have a million things running all at once. So this is really a good practice to use for your most important uh, dashboards and the ones that you know that people in your company are actually using all the time and they're, they really need to be fresh, your execs are looking at them, all that kind of stuff. Um, you probably don't want to put everything in your instance on that because you're just going to overwhelm um, the scheduler and, the data and your database. We do queue those things up, but it, you, know, you can do it if you want, but I'm just, I would recommend caution. So go forth and looker smart. Um, this is, that doesn't even look good on the big screen. So the two takeaways that I want you guys to leave with is really uh, the first one, the idea, the whole core purpose of smart caching is that it provides cached results when there's nothing new in your database and it gives you fresh results as soon as you know that there is something new in your database. So it's really the best way to leverage your ETL pipeline alongside Looker to make sure that your users are getting the best possible experience that they can, whether that experience is fast loading or fresh data. And the other takeaway is really Pretty much everybody should be using this. There's some way for you to apply this to your particular uh, company and your business, so I would encourage everyone to take a look at it.